All right, so now before we finish our calculation, let's let's define some things. So variance will be a measure of how spread out our entire data set is. Now variance gets used more in advanced statistics so we're not going to do a ton with it in this class but I want you to at least have seen it, have heard the terms, um, you'll use it for a few problems here and there. I'll actually use it more in chapters 9 and 10 and 11 sometimes than standard deviation. So the symbols are the population variance is sigma squared the sample variance is S squared. And you can see that the calculations are very similar. Now don't get all confused and look at the math and go, wow, all this is saying is say, hey, take your X value, your number, minus your mean, then square it to turn it positive, then add them all up. That's what we did. So this numerator right here is 1756, the number we just found. And to find the population variance, you would divide it by capital N, where capital N is the population size. For sample variance, you divide it by little n minus 1 instead. Little n being your sample size, not your population size, and x bar being your sample mean. Well, what's the difference? Well, um, and why is it n minus 1? <laughs> okay, so the difference between the two is the n versus the n minus 1. That's where the real difference comes in. The x bar and the mu, it's kind of, well, it's the same number. Um, if you knew what the actual value was for your data set. So you use whichever one's appropriate. So, so don't worry about the mu and the x bar, but the n versus the n minus 1, that's different. So this is saying, hey, I know the whole population size. So I can use the whole population and divide it by the population size. The one on the right is saying, I only have a sample, so I can't divide by n, because n wouldn't be very good because that would overestimate it. So I'm going to divide by n minus 1. All right, so what you're doing there is you're kind of fudging it a little bit, and I don't want to get into the semantics of why this works, but it does. It works if you divide by n minus 1. Dividing by a smaller denominator makes the overall fraction bigger. So you're basically saying, eh, I'm not as certain, um, so I'm going to divide by something a little bit smaller, makes the overall fraction bigger, makes it so that it's, it's okay that this was a sample and I didn't know as much about my data set. Little n minus 1 is actually called something very special. It's called the degrees of freedom. And that will come back to bite you in a big way in chapters 9 and 10 and 11. So for right now, just suffice it to say, all we're doing is dividing by n minus 1 to kind of compensate for the fact that we have a sample. And so it's not as good as the population. Now the standard deviation takes the variance and it undoes the square, squaring that we did. So you're saying, hey, you know, as part of this variance calculation that we did, we squared everything and then added them up and then we divide by how many there are. So we have to undo the squaring, otherwise we have square units which is kind of weird. So you take the square root of the variance and you have your standard deviation. And similarly the square root of the sample variance is, this, is the sample standard deviation. And the standard deviation is where it's at for us, at least for right now. It is a measure of how spread out our entire data set is. It, in other words, it measures the average distance the values in the data set are from the mean. And this is super powerful because it's telling us about the interior of the data points. I mean, it does not get much more powerful than this. This is one of the most important definitions that we learn. So, um, learn it, live it, highlight it. Right? The standard deviation is a measure of spread. Now you might notice that these formulas are very similar to each other. That's because the variance and the standard deviation are basically the same thing. Uh, the population variance is, or excuse me, the population standard deviation is the square root of the variance. And the sample standard deviation is the square root of the sample variance. There we have it. So that means that if you have the standard deviation, you can calculate the variance, and if you have the variance, you can calculate the standard deviation, right? There's a relationship going on here. Actually, that's a better thing to write. That's what I want to write here. The standard deviation, either population or sample, choose one, is the square root of the variance. So for example, the population standard deviation is the square root of the population variance, and the sample standard deviation is the square root of the sample variance. The variance by its same token is the standard deviation squared. So if you want the population variance, if you have the population standard deviation, you can just square it and you'll have the population variance. If you want the sample variance, if you take the sample standard deviation and square it, you'll have the sample variance. So this relationship right here is key, right? That will help immensely for a lot of the problems that you're given. Alright, so there's a lot of things, important things to note about all of this. Um, 
to start with, there are two flavors of standard deviation and variance. There's the population values, which are sigma or sigma squared, and then those are parameters because they're about a population. Then there are the sample values, which are s squared or s, right? which are statistics because, of course, they're sample values. Sample goes with statistics, population goes with parameter. The sigma values and sigma square values are called unadjusted in computer outputs. So if it says unadjusted somewhere, then that's the sigma ones. They won't say anything for the adjusted ones. They'll just say standard deviation. So if you just see standard deviation, that's s. If you see unadjusted standard deviation, that's sigma. The variance and the standard deviation are always non-negative, right? They can never be negative because you squared everything to turn it positive and then you added them all up. It's impossible for it to be negative. The lowest it could ever be would be zero. So you'd have to have a data set that has no variability, no variation at all, to have a variance or standard deviation of zero. It's possible, it's extremely unlikely, but it, ha it, it is possible. Um, the variance and the standard deviation are not resistant to outliers, just like the range wasn't. If you have an extreme data point, well, let's, let's start with this. These are calculated from the mean, right? Since the mean is not resistant, then neither is the standard deviation nor the variance because they are built off of the mean, and the mean is not resistant. And then there's units. So the standard deviation is great because the standard deviation has the same units as your data set. So if your data was in degrees, then your standard deviation's in degrees. If your data set was in feet, then your standard deviation's in feet, etc. Now variance is the standard deviation, or excuse me, the units of the data set squared which is weird, right? So it would be, you know, degrees Fahrenheit squared and dollars squared or points squared. And it's weird. That's because it's not really what we use for context explanation. So if we want to explain in context, we don't use the variance. We use the standard deviation. But the variance, like I was telling you earlier, is more useful for upper level stuff. So for higher level stuff, the variance is actually a little bit easier to work with because it does not involve the giant square root in it. And you'll see that perhaps later in chapters 9 and 10 and 11, the variance actually becomes a little bit easier to work with. But they go hand in hand. The bigger your variance, the bigger your standard deviation, the more spread out your data set is. The other thing to keep in mind is that we will never calculate this stuff by hand. We did it by hand once back here, and actually we're not quite finished with it, but we're getting there. Um, we haven't quite found the standard deviation and the variance yet. But right here, we're getting there, and we're never going to do it that way again. We're going to use our calculators or our computers or whatever to find the standard deviation. And the once you know the standard deviation, you can calculate the variance. The calculator does not actually give you variance, it gives you standard deviation, but you can use this relationship right up here, which hopefully you've highlighted to put right on your note sheet for your exam, hint, 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 because that relationship is how you're going to be able to calculate the variance when it gets given to you for a data set, right? So you're not gonna find it variance with your calculator, you're going to find standard deviation with your calculator, and then you would square it to find the standard deviation, or some to, be, to find the variance. We'll see some examples of that later. Now, how do we use this for interpretation? Well, I, I kind of have these out of order, but let's suffice it to say that they're both measures of spread. They go hand in hand like peas and carrots. The variance is just mathematically a little bit easier to work with because it doesn't have the giant square root. However, interpretation wise, the standard deviation is the better one. And that's because the standard deviation has the same units as your original data set right here. So the way you can think of standard deviation, well, let me, let me start that. Let me go to variance. Variance we're not going to use for practical interpretations. Again, it's something that's more useful later on, but it's not going to be something that we're going to be writing up a lot of interpretations for. Standard deviation, on the other hand, we're going to write a lot of interpretations for because it is roughly the give or take-ish from the mean that you expect in a symmetric data set. So in other words, if you expect most data is going to fall within a standard deviation or two. Um, standard deviation, I'll put this 
or two of the mean, right? So that's what we're going to, to use to interpret it. So we will see an example of that in the next video. But suffice it to say that the standard deviation is going to give us kind of a rough window where we think most of the data, most of the interior data points are going to fall somewhere within a standard deviation or maybe two of that mean.